Hi, I'm Peter Reinhardt, and welcome to the Johnson & Wales International Symposium on Bread. I'm coming to you from the Hans Auditorium in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we've held the last four bread symposiums. And as you can see, there's nobody here but me. And this is where we usually have it. The seats are all empty because this year, thanks to you, the symposium will be presented online virtually in our new presentation hall, which is where I will join you in just a minute. Thank you, and thanks for being part of our new virtual Johnson & Wales International Symposium on Bread, presented by Puratos. Welcome again. Throughout the entire symposium, I'll be thanking our generous sponsors over and over again, and ask that you do as well by visiting their booths and pavilions in the Exhibitor Hall. There you will see lots of bonus content and you can also make appointments to meet with the folks from these companies that serve our baking community so well. Our presenting sponsor is Puratos, who has partnered with us from the very beginning for all of our symposiums. And it is their support that helped us get this one of a kind gathering of thought leaders off the ground. Please also visit our fabulous flour and milling sponsors, Ardent Mills. Lindley Mills, and Central Milling. Thank you also to our equipment sponsors, the WP Bakery Group, an allied bakery and food service equipment. And thank you also to our specialty food product companies, ProBioTeam, Fire Within, Big Green Egg, and Mock Mill. Please check out all of their booths to learn about their wonderful and unique products. And also thanks to our media sponsors, Cook's Country, The Local Palette, The James Beard Foundation, and The Bread Bakers Guild of America. You'll be hearing more about all of them throughout the entire series of presentations. So again, thank you to all our sponsors. At the end of today's presentation, you will also see our credit scroll thanking all of the people behind the scenes who made this event possible, including our production and technical partner, Ganoid Communications, our creative team at Gumbo Marketing, and the many folks at Johnson & Wales University, our hosts for this, our fourth annual gathering. So stick around if you will. But now it's time to get things rolling with today's presentation. So let's go live and once again, Welcome to the Johnson & Wales International Symposium on Bread, presented by Puratos. Hello, 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 and welcome. Uh, hello. I'm Peter Reinhardt, and today is Wednesday, demonstration day, and uh, this, this week we're we're honored to have Carl Worley with us, the Biscuit King of Nashville, Tennessee, uh, Mr. Biscuit Love himself. Uh, and Carl, welcome and thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much. So, uh, you know, we want to get to your demo in just a minute because I know you're going to show us, uh, you know, one of your signature biscuits. Uh, and of course, we're going to throw the, the floor open to Q&A if anybody has uh, uh, questions or chat that you want to throw up there while Carl is working. Uh, Carl, would you, uh, once you get started on your demo, should we just let you run with it and take questions at the end? Or do you want to take questions as you go on the fly? No, we can totally take questions as I go. Um, I have uh, my lovely assistant, James, can fill those as well. Fantastic. Um, I will monitor the questions as they come in and feed them to you because uh, uh, not, not, not everybody else can speak during the webinar portion. And then, of course, later on, when we gather for the after party, those of you who could join us there, we will um, we'll continue to discuss and take questions and talk about Carl and his work. But uh, uh, and, and I want to remind all of you also that next week is Sprouted Grains Week. On Monday, we'll be uh, talking with Douglas Michael of Columbia County Breads in Pennsylvania, uh, who has built uh, an entire bakery business on making what he calls living bread with sprouted, sprouted grains. And then on Wednesday, Richard Miskovich, uh, the great baker and, uh, and my colleague, esteemed colleague at Johnson & Wales University, Richard will be doing a demonstration 
using sprouted flowers. So we'll be focusing a lot next week on this whole uh, category of unique flower called sprouted flower. And we should be able to answer most of your questions and uh, hopefully show you some new tricks on how to use it effectively. Uh, and again, one other thing before we get you started, Carl, I would like to make uh, invite um, my friend and colleague, Chris Plano from uh, Johnson and Wales Alumni Department uh, to make a special presentation to you as, uh, as one of our graduates. You are a, an alumni of Johnson and Wales University. Chris, why don't you go ahead and, uh, and make Carl uh, the presentation? Thank you so much, Chef Reinhardt, and thank you for having me here. And uh, Carl, thank you for being with us today. So looking forward to the to the presentation, and I, I know you're going to knock it out of the out of the park. But you know, each year uh, for the Johnson and Wales International Symposium on Bread, we give away an alumni award, and uh, this is a very very coveted and, and short list of alumni that have been awarded this award. So, Carl, duly noted for you. And when we were looking at the names for this year, yours rose to the top. And, and uh, when myself, Chef Reinhardt and several others were talking, yours definitely stuck out amongst the rest. So for your outstanding achievements in the world of baking and business entrepreneurship, you are an outstanding ambassador for the university presented to Carl Worley, class of 2010, August 4th, 2021, Johnson & Wales University, International Symposium on Bread Alumni Award recipient. Congratulations. Hey, hey thanks, Chris. Chris, hold Such up the honor. certificate. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so, uh, so Chris is going to mail that to you, Carl, and uh, and we're also going to send you a few uh, a gift as part of this award, uh, a collection of books from some of the presenters uh, at this year's or previous year's symposiums to add to your own library of of uh, baking books. Awesome. Thank you. No, Carl, congratulations again, and uh, we'll be putting this out on social media later today and throughout the rest of this week, and uh, um, we're so excited you're a part of the Bread Symposium this year, and again, congratulations on being on this very, very short list of alumni that have received this award over the last several years. Thank you. Very Thanks. honored to be a part. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, it's a short list because this is only our fourth symposium, so. Correct, yeah, and it's always, it's always a tough pick. <laughs> it's so <laughs> yeah. tough. There's so many names in the hopper. You know, every year, and, and and all of the alumni that are that are nominated are, you know, should all be winners. But at the end of the day, we can only pick one each year. So uh, again, a short list that will grow for for years to come. And for those of you who um, are new to all of this, um, the whole idea of that award is is we just want to acknowledge uh, graduates of the university, since Johnson Wales is really hosting this symposium, uh, who have done something significant and notable in the baking category, whether it's bread or, or products related to bread. Uh, and as we can see, uh, Carl will be showing us one of the reasons why he warrants this uh, and, and has made us proud because of the success that he's had out, had out there uh, you know, in the world using his education to build a successful business and to kind of further the work of baking. So uh, Chris, thank you for the presentation. Carl, thanks for being this year's recipient. And uh, with that said, uh, let me just turn it over to you, Carl. You've got a demo today. What are you going to be uh, showing us how to make today? Sounds perfect. So we started on the food truck with um, my grandmother's, I call them golden biscuits. They are yeast and baking powder raised biscuits. They're called angel biscuits. Um, it's kind of the technical name for them. And so uh, I'm going to demo those today. Uh, they're, they're a little different biscuit that not a lot of people get to see normally. Of course, as we so, as we go, we'll, we'll, if people do have questions, feel free to put them up on the Q and A. I'll feed them to Carl. But um, also, uh, just just for background, where are you coming from today? Where are you uh, Where are you doing this demo? So our restaurants are fortunately still absolutely just kicking it, um, and so I retreated to my home <laughs> to uh, to demo, which uh, a little smaller batch than what we normally do in a restaurant, but. Uh, but all the same. I'm so glad that the restaurants are still open, and uh, you know that you're you're navigating through all these these uh, COVID challenges. It is a different hoop every day, but we're blessed to be open and, and consider ourselves very lucky to have made it through the last year. How many uh, locations do you have? We have three biscuit loves. They're all around the Nashville area. All in the Nashville area. We haven't been brave enough to uh, to break through that that market yet. Yeah. And, and so it's called Biscuit Love. So obviously the, 
the heart and soul of the menu are it's, are the biscuits, right? Uh, so so before you get started, uh, how many different kinds of biscuits do you do? So we started out with Biscuit Loves in 2015 with one location. We had um, three different biscuits on the menu. Um, as we have, uh, we've been we've been fortunate and blessed. Uh, they say behind every smart man is an even smarter woman my wife handles all of the business end of it and so we have been fortunate enough to grow to over 2,000 biscuits a day and as that happens you can you, you you shrink down a little bit and pare down your offerings and so uh, right now we're going with one biscuit of course coming out of covid um, staffing challenges things like that all right. Well, is, is now the one biscuit that you actually make at the at the restaurants? Is it the one you're going to show us today, or is this one that uh, they can't get if they go to the restaurant right now? So the one we're doing at the restaurant right now is a. Um, it's it. We I think one of uh, if I can toot my own horn a little bit. One of the one of the good things about a chef, and one of the things that marks a great chef is knowing when to step out of the way, um, and. About a year ago, I, I stepped out of the way and let Lisa Marie White, who is an incredible baker in her own right, um, step into the to the helm just in time to hit COVID. Um, and so she was brilliant enough through that to um, pull in a biscuit that is pretty much this biscuit, but reimagined through her brain. Okay, beautiful. Well, let's see how it how it works in your way. <laughs> Love it. Thank you so much. All right. So. Like I said, this, this started as my grandmother's biscuit. And when we started a food truck, my wife and I uh, did a lot of testing and, and the, the biscuits that I make at home are just a simple drop biscuit, um, easy to get into the oven, easy to take out. Um, but, but when we started testing, one of the things with our restaurant is we like to put a lot of ingredients on it. So we'll put uh, fried chicken and cheddar cheese and sausage gravy and fried chicken and mustard and pickles on different biscuits. Uh, and that drop biscuit didn't hold up as well uh, as this biscuit. Uh, it also has a special place in my heart because it was my grandmother's special occasion biscuit. Uh, it's a little more finicky, it's a little more challenging, but I also think it's a little more special and it's a little, little more of something that, that not a lot of people have seen. So I was honored when I got to, to show you guys today. And so um, what I'm gonna do is, like I said earlier, it's a, both a yeast and baking powder raised biscuit. So double, double activated there. So um, my, my, I wish that I could, everybody could be in a room and we could just eat biscuits all day, but um, you will have to trust me on this until you make them. It's, it's like a biscuit and a roll had a baby is the best way I can describe it. Um, but it holds up well. As we started the food truck and we started with this biscuit, um, I also figured out during the winter time here in Nashville, it gets really cold and people don't want to come out. Um, you could par bake these biscuits. Um, so if you're serving six, 700 people on a Sunday, you can actually par bake these biscuits, um, store them in a walk-in, pull them out the next day, throw a little butter on them and um, heat them up. And they're just as good as if they came out of the oven. Uh, very versatile biscuit um, on the website um, through uh, the symposium, there are two different, I, there's a deck of uh, recipes that I shared, has this recipe, a bunch of other different um, biscuit recipes in it, um, also uh, a few of our favorite toppings. And then there's also something I don't normally share, which is straight out of our recipe books from the restaurant. And so you have an actual guide for the 200 biscuit, which is the way that we make them in the restaurant uh, batches. Uh, this biscuit is actually still used in the restaurant. I forgot to say that when, when Peter was talking earlier, but this is actually what we use for uh, what's called bonuts. Uh, and I'll get to that a little bit later, but I'll start with, uh, so what we're gonna do, and, and the way that I always did this is the way that my grandmother did it. Um, I'm Southern and so I, I don't rock tradition too much, uh, but I try to understand it. And so um, I'm gonna do a small batch here for you guys. And um, what we have is we have a little active dry yeast. Um, if I can get cake yeast, absolutely. Um, in the world that we live in right now, you get what you get and you don't put your fit as my 11 year old says. And so um, active dry yeast, I put a little bit of sugar in here. My grandmother always did it. I asked her why and she said, I don't know. Uh, my mom always did it. Uh, I went digging, uh, just allows the yeast to bloom a little bit. 
And I, I always do this step, bloom it, just because, if, especially in a restaurant setting where I'm doing 200 biscuits, I don't want to get down the road and figure out that my yeast is not going to work. Um, so this is something we always do. I'm turn my scale on here. Um, the recipe deck has everything in cups. Um, the professional recipe that I, that I added is everything in grams. Uh, in the restaurant, of course, we use grams um, exclusively. It's, it's a lot more uh, accurate. Um, and so um, trusty scale of our uh, yeast, sugar, a little bit of water. And so I'm gonna zero out. I like my water around 125, maybe a little less. I'm gonna swirl that around. And let's make sure that that's active. Before we, before we begin, while that's going, I've got my dry ingredients. You can see behind me the nice folks that um, at Anson Mills uh, sent some flour. Uh, biscuits are a good 85% flour. And so if you use flour that doesn't taste like anything, you'll probably get biscuits that doesn't taste like anything. Uh, there are some, you know, sugar and butter and salt and a few other things, but you really want to use good ingredients. And chances are, if you're cooking these at home, you're cooking them once a week. And so why not splurge a little bit um, and try some different flours. Um, it, it makes all the difference in the world, and even if it does mess up. Uh, with that flour, you're out $5 instead of three. Um, and, and it's just, I, I believe in quality flour. We've always used locally milled flour at Biscuit Love as much as we can. And as we expanded into a pizza place, uh, we've started working even closer with uh, millers and, and trying to get different products that not everybody can do and not everybody can have. Uh, it just makes a lot better product. So flour. Did you say that that flour is, an, is that an um, all purpose flour? Please don't tell my grandmother or this is a pastry flour. That's a good question. So with biscuits, we're not wanting the gluten structure that we would have in a normal uh, in a pizza or a bread. And so we want to use a um, low protein flour um, something that's a little more forgiving. And so you certainly can use an all-purpose flour. Uh, don't not make biscuits because you can't find uh, red winter wheat flour or a recipe calls for um, the, the big one for the Southerners are, is white lily. Uh, please don't make it just because you can't find that. Worst come to worst and you can't find it, mix half cake flour, half all-purpose flour, it's gonna get you close. So, um, but try to find the softest flour that you can uh, it was a fun uh, exercise for me a few years ago. We started ordering flowers from all different um, types of mills in to try to duplicate um, some biscuits that we had seen when we were uh, on a fun trip. And it was amazing to see the difference. Uh, these biscuits I learned were, were literally self-rising flour and um, buttermilk. And it was amazing when you take it down to just those two ingredients, you can tell such a difference in flowers. So um, all-purpose flour, I use, in the restaurants, we use all-purpose flour from Weisenberger out of Kentucky um, with these. And so it's a, it's a Southern meal they're using. I know what wheat they're using. And so their all-purpose is a little lighter, a little, little softer. Um, good question. So flour, salt, baking powder, a little baking soda, a little sugar. Like I said, don't tell my grandmother. Um, she would not approve. If you don't want sugar in your biscuits, don't put it in there. We put just enough because we're, um, my brilliant wife taught me long ago that I'm baking for people, not baking for myself. So um, I'm going to sift all of these ingredients. Um, makes it a little, little lighter, but it also allows me to make sure that there's nothing in there. Um, that I would want in there. We're using small meals and they're great, uh, but with anything, there could be uh, some sort of contaminants in there and this is gonna make sure that that, that doesn't happen. Um, so as I sift this in, I 
wanted to let you know, I have, uh, I'm, I'm fortunate enough at home to have a convection oven, so I've got it preheated to 400. Um, it's been going for a little while just so it can thoroughly heat up. If you don't have a convection oven at home, uh, 425. In the restaurant, we do these at 400. Um, and I also have something that's a little, little wacky that um, I don't think probably many of you have seen is I have my butter melting for these. And so we'll get to that here in just a moment. Someone asked, um, some of the recipes asked for butter, someone asked for shortening. A few of my friends swear that water. What are the trade offs there? Um, the, the biggest trade off is what, what do you want it to taste like? Um, if I'm at home on the weekend, I will, and I have lard, I'll use half lard, half butter. I like the, um, I like the taste difference. Um, you sure, certainly can use shortening. A lot of the recipes will use shortening. Um, mainly, I think a lot of them that I've seen were written shortly after the war. And, and I think it was more of just a, an item that, um, and into the 50s and 60s where shortening was uh, revolutionary and going to take over the world. Um, I like something personally with a little bit more flavor. Um, a lot of my friends swear by shortening and different, different things. Um, I've actually used bacon fat um, in these, uh, especially good smoky bacon fat will, will blow people's mind um, and allow you to, uh, to incorporate a little bit more flavor into this. Something Peter didn't mention was I was a uh, graduate of the, uh, not the baking program. So things that I do would probably, he might be driven crazy by the end of this and take my, take my award away. <laughs> so everything is sifted in here, mixed really well. I don't know if you guys can see that at home. James will switch over to a, to a different camera. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a well in the middle of this. While I've got that going on, you can certainly see yeast is activated. Everything's bubbly. Um, everybody's happy. So I said earlier, melt your butter. My grandma always did this. Every other biscuit I've ever made, I will either cube it or I personally like to throw it in the freezer and grate it. Um, makes it a lot easier on me. Um, and so it makes it a lot easier on people who are making 1,000, 2,000 biscuits a day. But I never understood and never, never really thought about it until after I went to Johnson Wells and started and, and got all got all my knowledge, got learned, uh, as they say, where I'm from. And um, I was like, huh, she throws it in and then she'll throw buttermilk over on top of it. Why is she doing this? And so um, same answer as my mom did it. But what I started figuring out is it allows for the butter to go in. You pour the cold buttermilk on top of it. And it'll actually seize back up and, and create um, almost like smaller shards of, of butter. And so it keeps you from grating it. And I, and I would imagine that it happened because it was just an easier step and, and somebody was thoughtful enough to try that and it worked and, and off we went. Um, it doesn't give you as much of a butter flavor as, as if you chunk the butter and put it in. But I, I do it just because I've always been used to it. Um, but I also like the flavor in this because I want that that funky yeasty flavor to shine through. And so I want the butter to be a background flavor. So I've got it set. I'm gonna throw my, my melted butter in. James said I have something on. If you were using a uh, lard or shortening, would you also melt that as well? If you're using lard or shortening, would you also melt that? Yes, absolutely. Keep going. 
Oh, James. I'm going to throw buttermilk on top of this, and then I'm going to talk for a second about buttermilk. So you can see cold buttermilk straight out, hot butter. And I'm just going to mix that in just a touch. <clears throat> you can see it starting to come together and the butter starting to, to chill out. I do that just so it, just in case the butter is, is a, at a temperature where it could kill the yeast, it will, it will cool it down just a touch. I'm going to go on top with my yeast. And then I'm gonna turn my mixer on speed one and go until it's almost together. And my mixer here being my hand. Uh, even in the restaurant, we still mix every biscuit by hand. Um, I think we've tried it a few different times with a few different people that have come in and said, I think I could make a biscuit that nobody could tell by machine and, and you can always tell, um, I think personally. Um, and so I want to mix it just until it comes together. I also want to see what it's looking like. You can see how shaggy it is. I'll get James to get in here. Getting up underneath and folding it over with my hands. Just want to make sure that I'm getting everything off the bottom. This is gonna be a, this dough is gonna be just a touch wet right now when it comes together. I also don't worry as much about getting every, if there's a little bit of flour left in there, as long as it's not, you see the bottom of my bowl, there's nothing there. As long as all that's good, I don't worry about getting every little touch of flour hydrated. What I wanna do now is I'm gonna leave this alone, let the yeast start working just to make sure that we're good. Um, while that happens, it's gonna hydrate. Um, I usually leave it for five or 10 minutes just to let it, let it begin to go. I'm gonna set this off to the side. I'm gonna wash my hands real quick. And then we'll toss some butter while that's going. So buttermilk, um, we try to buy as local as, can, as we can. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, things happen and we lost one of our large local uh, milk producers here in Nashville. Um, and so we have been scrambling to find a replacement. So while I was in the restaurant today, I just picked this up. And so I'll cover the brand here. Um, buttermilk, when I was in Knoxville, Tennessee, this is by far my favorite buttermilk that I've ever had, personally. Uh, it's Cruise Farm. They have 80 cows, uh, 80 happy cows that eat, but, that eat uh, grass every day. Uh, and I'm pretty sure they get sung to as they, as they get milked. Um, and so this brand from Nashville <clears throat> says, and I never really looked until a few years ago, uh, milk, um, food starch, modified locust bean gum, mono and diglycerides, a lot of things I can't pronounce. Um, I never really thought about, I thought buttermilk was buttermilk, milk and, and a, uh, uh, something to make it turn. And um, lo and behold, I started reading the ingredient labels and was like, whoa. And so Try to get as, as good of milk as you can. I could pour these out. You probably wouldn't be able to see on the screen, but this is a, a yellow milk, uh, which is good because it, it shows that the cows are grass fed instead of uh, uh, fed on hay. 
Um, but if you read the ingredients on this, it's a uh, uh, milk culture. And that's it. So, um, like I said earlier, your, your ingredients are so few on biscuits that you want to really look at everything that you can uh, and what you're putting into it. So, this buttermilk has actual chunks. So, if you, when you pour it out, you're going to get chunks of buttermilk, uh, chunks of butter in with it. So, it's going to help. It's going to taste a lot better uh, on that. So, We also, in, in the restaurant, we'll try, we use, there's a few different stuff out here. We use, a, we use just a standard butter in the restaurant. Um, I personally like, if I can't find an uh, A-grade butter, I like the taste of an A-grade butter a little better. Personally, I think it has a little more funk to it generally um and so if you've never had just spoonfuls of butter you should try it um there's nothing better to do on a saturday afternoon um what i have the, the normally when i melt and they'll come out of the oven i'll put something a little better on it um something with a little higher butter fat on it um and so we'll keep some of this around the house um and then it's really easy if you want to do something special um let some of that come up to room temp, throw a little bit of um, salt. If you have a little Malden, um, throw it in, throw about 50% um, cane syrup or sorghum in, uh, depending on how funky you like it. Um, mix that together and serve it with your biscuits. It, it, it makes all the difference in the world. So. And see, we've started rising just a little bit. I've got my uh, my house at 65 degrees, so I don't sweat all over camera. Um, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to take these over and we're going to roll them out. Got it. As much as I do this, I'm still not not. Marsha Kramer, my, my culinary pastry icon at Denver, Johnson & Wells. It's still not like the way I put flour down. I'll leave my dough a little bit wet because I can, I can add a little bit of flour as I go. We talked about gluten earlier. I want to work this the least amount possible, but I also want just a little bit of gluten structure and otherwise I'm not going to get, I'm going to get really just biscuits without a lot. I, I would like a little bit of, um, I like tenderness, but I also want just a touch of, of gluten to let you know that I'm eating bread. And so just kind of pat these out. Trifle. Roll them out to the thickness of We go about a half inch in the restaurant. I promise I will not show up at your house if you want to go quarter inch or if you want to go three quarters. Some of my favorite biscuits are, are small. So we'll take a cutter. I tend to, to dip it after every biscuit. When you see me go in, I'm gonna put the cutter in. It's a really sharp cutter, straight down, straight up. In the restaurant, we actually will go through a lot of cutters because I don't want them to be dull. If they're dull, or you'll see, sometimes you'll see people um, I'll kind of go this way so you can see it. They'll go in and twist. When they do that, they're actually sealing the edges of the biscuits and, and you'll see the center rise. Um, 
but the mid or the middle will rise and then the outside will kind of it, they'll have pinched it closed. Gonna go around. Try to get as many out of this as I can. Every time I roll it, these are gonna be a little tougher, and they're also not gonna rise nearly as much. We on the food truck, uh, you try to, as with any restaurant, really, I guess, you try to use everything you can as much as you can. And so we will roll the, um, the, the ladies that do it now are far better than I ever was. They can roll them three times and the third roll, it's just as good as the first. And so with that, I could only get two out of mine. And the third roll was always uh, leftovers. And so on the food truck, we would, I tried biscuit churros. Uh, people kind of like those in the South. We have, we have something called chocolate gravy. So I served biscuit churros with chocolate gravy. Um, they, they went, they went okay. Um, and then, uh, at, at one point I kind of threw, uh, bow nuts on the menu, uh, biscuit donuts. This was 2014, I guess, on the food truck, and we, we started, we had to pull them off the menu, actually, because people would order those, and, and we didn't have enough room in our fryer for chicken and biscuit donuts, so um, thank goodness in the restaurant we have that back on the menu, so it's one of our most popular items, and it's the reason just that to these be, biscuits continue in this form to be made in the restaurant. Just to be clear about that, are you saying that to make a, a, a churro, you simply you take the same biscuit that you just made and deep fry it? So yeah, so churro and bonus. Same exact dough. I did one pan of these. You can see I, I tucked them kind of together. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna brush them with a little more butter because I, or you can use whatever. Biscuits can throw really, uh, don't think about them uh, as just for breakfast. They can also throw, it's really cool. You could um, take your lard or butter and you can you can put a little thyme and garlic and, and let it uh, simmer on the stove for about 30 minutes and then use that. Uh, you're gonna put some savory flavors in with it. You can actually add a little cheese to the dough, do some different things. Um, once those are buttered, I'm going to set them on the back of the stove and I'm going to let them rise until they've risen about 25% more than what they are now. Um, I'm going to grab my scraps and I'm going to come back over in front of you. So biscuit churros, biscuit donuts. Let's pretend for the sake of uh, Zoom that we've rolled it out twice. We've got all of our biscuit. These are our leftovers. They're tough. Um, I'll actually just kind of work it a little bit. Just to give it a little bit more gluten structure. Grab my... So what we do from here on the churros, I would pull off some, roll it in my hands, because I can't really extrude it through a machine. Well, I get it thin, and I would just drop that in a fryer and let it go. With the bow nuts, and I think the reason people like them a little bit better, is we started taking them, um, rolling them, and then we'll put those on a, a sheet tray, and let them sit for about 15, 20 minutes and proof out. Uh, and then we'll go into the fryer with it from there. Uh, in the restaurant, we like to serve them with, uh, we'll pull them out of the fryer, toss them in sugar, um, and then serve them with a blueberry compote. We'll take uh, wild Maine blueberries, cook them down with about 10% sugar, um, 
and just get them syrupy, not to a full jam consistency. Um, we'll go to about two, 204 to 206 uh, if, you're, if you're technical. Uh, and, and that way it'll stick to it, but it's not where it's, it's super thick. And then we like to pipe them. I, I love to, to take and we'll whip, we'll make a fresh lemon curd and whip it 50-50 with um, mascarpone cheese. And so we'll pipe that in the center of them. Uh, so it has a, a pretty good uh, yin and yang of that, so. On the Minnesota website, you show some square biscuits or all of your biscuits square and you remove the whole cutting and circles and rework them with the thing. Absolutely. Uh, now they are square. Um, these can definitely be square. Um, I like to joke, Wendy's, uh, probably most of you wasn't alive during the 80s, but Wendy's had this really fun TV ad um, series that said all of our burgers are square because we don't cut corners. Um, and so since nobody was alive, I like to uh, I like to joke with my team that that's why they're all square. Um, Lisa Marie um, doesn't believe in biscuit cutters. She believes in very sharp knives. Um, and so she will take a very sharp knife, cut them all into squares. Um, and that's how they became square. And, but they're also, when you do that, you, you don't have to worry about your second and third roll. Um, and so you've already got all your biscuits. You're using every, every scrap, every piece. Good question. So what we're gonna do is through the, through the magic and power of imagination, we're gonna act like these have risen because we've only got an hour. If it were me, I'd let these go for about 20 or 30 more minutes. Uh, just let them get good and at the top. Um, sheet pan, I'll let them go to the top. If they go much over that, they'll overproof. Um, and, and they'll be fine for most. Um, but let's go to the top of the pan, call it good, into the oven. And we'll throw those in there. And then what I want to, um, while that's going and in, I'm gonna put them in there for 12 minutes. James has 15 hands and is setting a timer as he's running two cameras and, and feeding me all the things. So what I did earlier in, uh, cause I idle hands make the devil's work as, a, as my, my people say. Um, I made a few different biscuits because I want to show you a few difference. So here is round biscuits cut out, allowed to proof, and um, baked off. You'll notice if you're using um, if you're using like a white lily or an all-purpose flour that you get at the grocery store, your biscuits will not be this dark. Uh, the reason that they're this dark is is from the flour. Um, they'll still be golden brown, GBD. Uh, as Johnson Wells likes to say, um, but they won't go this dark. Um, the cool thing about using different flowers from different meals is you get all these different flavors. These almost taste like you put honey in the dough. Um, it just has a lot of unique flavors that you're not gonna find normally in flour. These were allowed, these, once they rose, they touched each other and they held on tight. Biscuits uh, are not pandemic uh, uh, friendly. They don't like social distancing. And so um, I did a few things just so you could see. Let me pull one of these out. You're going to get the crack one open. I don't know if you can zoom in. So you can see the crumb structure. You're not gonna get big, huge um, bubbles like you would in, in bread that you allow to proof out. Um, but these are gonna hold up, be more substantial. These are also very, very good to go, sweet or savory, um, which is why we like them is, is you can, if you go sweet, I tend to stay away from things that are all sugar. And so I like these because it, if you put uh, something sweet with it, it really balances out with, with how, um, how savory these are. OK, 
pandemic biscuits. So I had six left over. And so I just threw them on a tray without. I'm sure all of you have made biscuits. I'm sure all of you are masters, but um, this is what you're gonna get. Some people like this, I don't. Um, flat, I allow these to proof the same. And so you can see inside, they, they, they look very similar, but they didn't rise nearly as much. I'll put, uh, And so I have also, what I've done in, if we're doing biscuits and I, I get to a part, point where before we, we got good and I had a lot of very intelligent women who could make a, a perfect batch and make it go on a pan perfectly, I've been known to put some scraps and kind of tuck them that way to push them together um, just to give them something to rise up on. Uh, and also I'll put another pan right up against it just to kind of give it something to, to, to rise. I also, my nice friends at Lodge, make sure that I have enough cast iron to last three lifetimes. You really only need one skillet. Um, and so I've loved on this one for a while. This is the same biscuit tucked in together, allowed to rise under the, under a, in a cast iron skillet. What you're gonna get with a cast iron skillet that you guys can't see is, you'll see. <clears throat> you're gonna get a lot more Maillard reaction, a lot, a lot crispier edges on it. And so that's gonna give it a lot more flavor. Um, if I had my way, I would have make 2000, have somebody, cause I can't do it, make 2000 biscuits a day in cast iron skillets. Uh, I, I approached that with my team at one point and um, mutiny ensued. And so I gave up. What I also did, I ran out of biscuits. I ran out of first roll biscuits when I got here. And so there's a really intelligent lady in Atlanta, um, biscuit queen, Erica Council. And something I learned from her was take all your scraps and just kind of stuff them in there and, and give it. So you can see the middle, I purposefully did scraps in the middle. And so I don't have to serve this. I'm gonna, that's what I'm gonna eat while before I serve it uh, to my family. Um, but you can, it gives it something to, to push against and rise. So don't throw your scraps away. Um, you wanna use every piece of that. When these came out of the oven while they were still piping hot, brush them really good with butter one more time. Um, brush them with lard, brush them with, with different things. Um, and so try that. And then um, while these are still in the oven, does anybody have any questions? James is gonna unmute me so I can hear. Yeah. Um. I'm, if not, I think that to I'm, me, this is, my, this is what Peter again with the question. Uh, uh, what's unique about these to me is the, that hybrid of yeast and baking powder. I mean, usually we think of biscuits as more of a baking powder or baking soda kind of product. Um, what do you think? What does the um, the use of the yeast do to to make these biscuits different from a from a typical baking powder biscuit? Yeah. Uh, they are, no matter how much baking powder, if you use the correct amount of baking powder, uh, a normal biscuit that's risen only with baking powder is still going to have a really tight crumb, um, more of a cake density. These are a lot lighter. Um, you, can, you can eat three of these versus one regular biscuit. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and so completely different. The re they held up better for us on sandwich form, but it also gave me the chance. People, uh, I started a biscuit restaurant in the South and we started actually in a, in a borrowed food truck. And so I started the biscuit truck in the South where everyone grows up eating biscuits. Yeah. And so um, start a pizza restaurant in Italy 
it's going to be hard. Everybody has their idea of what a perfect biscuit is if you've grown up with them. Um, I grew up with biscuits most days, every weekend day, we had biscuits on the table. Um, I knew what I liked, I knew what I didn't like. And so I knew that there was going to be a challenge with people from uh, around going, that's not my grandmother's biscuit. It could be 15 times better than, than most grandmother's biscuits. They're still going to like their grandmother's more because that's, that's that ingrained food memory that's deep down in your gut that I'll never reach. Um, I feel like these have a completely different flavor profile, enough to where people go, that's really different, not what I grew up with, but I kind of like that, and it's kind of cool. Are there other um, biscuit places in the area that, that you're aware of that, that make this style of biscuit, or is this, this really pretty much uniquely your, your take? I haven't... I've had a lot of biscuits, um, especially over the last seven or eight years. And I haven't been to a place that has these same biscuits. A lot of places will use uh, either drop biscuits or standard biscuits, um, go through that. And they're, it's amazing, just like bread, any bread, to see the difference in very few ingredients and see what people's hands can do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've never seen this type at any other place. You um, obviously you're making a lot of biscuit sandwiches. So uh, what where are some of the like maybe three or four most popular menu items? Three or four most popular. Uh, our East Nasty, which won um, Crazy Enough One Sandwich of the Year by Bon Appetit Magazine the year we opened. Um, fried chicken. We only use chicken thigh um, and it's topped with cheddar cheese and our sausage gravy, um, which, which is one of my favorite things. Uh, if I go in, I like, a, I, I like a simple biscuit and gravy. A lot of my family will come in and eat biscuits and gravy, which is very near and dear to me because that's what we grew up on. And so a lot of them like my, my version. Um, and so that's when of course, we're in Nashville and hot chicken is still the rage here. And so we do a Nashville style hot chicken, which is dipped in a um, spicy oil mixture. Um, and then we top that with a really great whole grain mustard, um, house made pickles, um, and a little bit of honey just to kind of cool the heat a little bit. Uh, those are our two. We, we sell those along with the Southern Benny. Um, which is my take on, a, on an eggs benedict. I didn't want to do an eggs benedict when we started. And so we, we found Edwards out of uh, Kentucky, did a great ham that they, uh, it's a country ham that's cured the old fashioned way, but then they cook it. So it makes it a little more tender. Uh, we put that with sausage gravy and two eggs. That's our healthy option. <laughs> um. When you mentioned the, the, the fried chicken, are those boneless thighs? Boneless thighs. If I had my way, it wouldn't be, but, but my wife is smarter than I am. But you're putting it on the biscuit. You're not serving it on the side, right? So it's like a like a, a, a fried chicken sandwich? Oh, yeah, fried chicken sandwich. So you need it to be boneless. So can you, uh, without giving away the uh, the family jewels, can you share a little bit about your how you do your fried chicken, what your, what your, your batter is? Uh, you know, secret is? Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, we do, we, we brine it for 24 to 48 hours, do a dry brine. So salt, a little bit of uh, smoked paprika, um, cayenne, a few other ingredients, um, pull that out. We have a, a wet batter that we batter it in um, and fry it and it puffs up. Uh, it's, it's more of almost like a fish and chips batter is what I like. Huh. Um, recipes out there. Um, I always tell people, I'll give you any recipe that's the, that you want. Uh, the only caveat is, is when you make it better, you have to give it back to me. <laughs> so that's interesting. So you don't use a, a, a flour, a flour dip. You do, you put it in a batter and then go right from the batter to the fryer. Yes. Yes. Well, yeah. 
Yeah, and we, we play with a few different ways. I like that batter, especially on the hot chicken biscuit because it, it puffs up and it gives a little little more, a few more cracks and crevices for that hot oil to go into. Um, and so that was my, my biggest thing when we started. Does, does, the, does the heat go into the batter or is it? Okay. So the best I could tell when I, um, before the hot chicken craze got really huge, I, um, it was started at a place called Prince's here and, and they would not allow anyone in the kitchen. <laughs> but with my best with my best culinary deduction, I figured out that they they melt they did cayenne and oil. Um, and they did hot oil right out of the fryer. Cayenne mixed it together, dipped it while it was still hot. Uh, and then they hit it with seasoned salt, which is uh, what Southerners put on everything. Mm. And so um, we went back and kind of played with that a few a few different ways and got our way. Uh, and so it, it when you dip it, it's going into super hot oil, and so that cayenne just kind of, kind of holds on to the to the batter that's there. When you pull it out, it you want the oil hot enough for it it will go away, just leaving that spice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I last time I was in Nashville was a while ago, and it was before the hot, the hot chicken craze hit. So I've never really had authentic, you know, hot chicken in Nashville itself. Uh, but it's on my list, you know, the, whether it's Prince's or anywhere. Everybody's now claiming to be, you know, even better than Prince's. But uh, it's, it's <laughs> such a, it's such a cultural kind of a identity marker now for Nashville, and it's and it's really come on strong just only in the last few years. It's amazing, it, and it's funny, I joke with people, when we started a food truck, when we were talking about this, my wife and I went back and forth on ideas, and, and this was uh, 2012, she said, what do you want to do? And I said, I really want to do a hot chicken truck, because I think there's only a couple places you can get it, and I really enjoy going and getting it, and I think we can bring it to the masses. And I'll never forget her looking at me going, that's the dumbest idea. <laughs> which it probably was. I probably would have never survived under that, but um, she's also the one that said, I really love your biscuits and I would I would do biscuits and then you could do hot chicken. You can do a lot of different things on a biscuit. Yeah, yeah. I hear it. Uh, this is an important question that came through. Uh, uh, do you ever have customer requests for gluten-free biscuits? We do, uh, more and more often. Um, and it's something that, there's so much flour going around our restaurant. It, it yeah. scares me to death to even think about. And so we, we just haven't done it. Um, even if we created a gluten-free biscuit, there's so many, so much flour rolling around from the yeah. chicken from making 2000 biscuits a day that um, it would be, it would be impossible and I wouldn't sleep at night. Yeah, I understand that. I was thinking the same thing. Uh, it's tough to, in a, in a flour full environment to do something that requires the absence of flour, of, of wheat. Um, uh, let's see, someone just wrote something else. Uh, well, I, I appreciate the integrity of your response. And that's from Charles, Charles Luce, who is going to be presenting in a couple of weeks. So he's our gluten-free presenter this year. So he's the expert on gluten-free. So, uh, awesome. so thank you, Charles. Thank you, Charles. So, so, um, Carl, what I'm thinking is, is we're coming to the end of the hour. It's unbelievable. This hour kind of flew by. Um, the, the, the biscuits that you put in the oven, did they, uh, did, have they finished baking or are they still happening? They're pretty close. You can see where I didn't allow them to proof fully. Yeah. I'd leave these in for about five more minutes, let them get a little bit more brown. Um, you could certainly pull them out at this point. I can tell... They probably need a couple more minutes. They would remain pretty close to this. Um, I could pull them out of the oven at that point, allow them to cool, put them in a walk-in. If I'm cooking in, in, a, in a restaurant environment, in a, especially in an environment where I'm going to, uh, a lot of times we'll, we've been blessed to be able to go to uh, different food and wine festivals and be able to feed a lot of people. Uh, unfortunately, you're trying to feed 2,000 people in four hours. And so 
we have figured out these will a couple more minutes as long as they're they're baked and not not brown you can pull them out cool them store them in a walk-in wrapped real tight um bring them somewhere heat them back up wash them with butter and they're, like i said they're they're just as good kind of like a brown and syrup biscuit oh there's the timer so um so when they do come out of the oven let's say you're going to take them all the way would you brush them with butter when they come out of the oven or just uh, leave them uh, un, unbrushed? I, I typically always brush them with butter. I don't think that there's uh, too, too much butter doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. And everything goes better with more butter. Um, That's right. Well, as you said, uh, when you enter into the, the realm, the biscuit land of the South and, and know that everybody's grown up with a family favorite, version of it that uh, there's, there's no way you can you can uh, win the argument of there's a one biscuit better than everybody else because everybody's biscuits the best uh, but I think it's great that you know that, that what you pointed out is how important it is to kind of find find ones that really represent something that you're connected to that you have a sense of connection to that you love that you and then you want to share that love you know with with other people through whether in your case the restaurant or or just family meals so so thank you so much for, for showing us this. Uh, every, for the question that came up earlier, where are the recipes? You can find the recipes uh, in, the, uh, in the dashboard. We have a folder, a recipes folder, and Carl's kind enough to give us uh, a number of recipes today, right? Uh, did you, I, I haven't looked yet, but you've, you sent us this yeah, recipe. Yeah, we, we have our current biscuits. There's a form of our current biscuits. Uh, Lisa Marie gave me an older version of her biscuit to, to share. Um, there's these, one of my favorites, uh, which when I was talking about buttermilk earlier, Sharon Benton, um, the matriarch of uh, Benton's Bacon uh, fame, um, her biscuit recipes in there. But then there's also, we do jam a little different uh, in the restaurant and there's a few different uh, recipes. And if anybody has a, a desire for any other recipes, just let me know. I'll, I'll share really it. appreciate that. Thank you so much. And Carl, thanks so much for for sharing all of this and for also for joining us in the, for the next hour in our VIP lounge as we as we shift over. So I wanna invite all of you who are watching who, who can come uh, sw switch over, to navigate over to the, to the VIP lounge. Uh, Carl and I will log out of this webinar and we'll log back in so that we can go and visit and be with you in that lounge. And um, uh, Carl, bring some biscuits to the uh, to the to the lounge. I don't. Unfortunately, we can't pass them through the screen. Hopefully, some of you who are watching or making biscuits at home. Uh, but uh, again, we'll we'll keep the conversation going, and this will be a chance for those of you who do have either comments or questions about you know really it's your chance to pick Carl's brain bone and everything he knows about biscuits, and also some other the life lessons you've had in uh, opening a restaurant and going from you know culinary school into the real world, so to speak, and making it, you know, making it happen. Sounds like the, the journey went through the food truck. Did you ever get that food truck going? You did have that going, right? First? We did. We did, we, we did it for three years. Three years. And that led to the brick and mortar uh, cafes of uh, Biscuit Love. So again, Carl, thank you so much. Uh, our Johnson & Wales Alumni of the Year. Uh, thank you for, for being that as well. And uh, for everybody else, uh, join us again on Monday for uh, Doug Michael, who was gonna be doing sprouted uh, a whole, a whole not just how to make sprouted bread, but talk about the journey he had in trying to create a category, uh, a, a cafe and bread category based on, a, on really something that was new to the, to the public. How do you create a market for something that no one's ever had before? So Monday will be that. And then uh, Wednesday, we'll be back with another demo uh, with Richard Miskovich. So join us again next week. And then for every week, for the next couple of months, we've got a long way to go, but uh, again, Carl, thank you. We'll see you in the VIP lounge and we'll see all of you next week or in the lounge. Join us there. Thank Bye -bye. you. you to our team behind the scenes. Our event technical and production partners, Ganoid Communications, including our producer, Gurmit Singh, and his team, Jida Gajaria, Gagandeep Singh, 
and J. Dev Kashari. Thanks also to Ted Nelson and Lael Fretzel of our creative and marketing team at Gumbo Marketing, and the many folks at Johnson & Wales University who supported me throughout this event. My executive assistant, Sarah Standifer, communications director, Melinda Law, Chancellor Mim Rooney, Charlotte campus president, Cheryl Richards, and our executive team leaders, deans and faculty, Maureen Dumas, Michael Schrader, Michelle Nicholas, Mark Norman, Brent Steyerwalt, Laurie Heinbach, Jerry Lanuza, Amy Felder, Harry Paymiller, Richard Miskovich, and many, many others. Thank you all. <laughs>